My name is Andrew Graham. I am the Direct Markets Coordinator for NOFA Vermont, starting just recently. Just want to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for supporting the Winter Conference this year. I'm sure that a lot of these names are very familiar to you, but please do take a moment to Note all of these wonderful Vermont businesses and cooperatives and nonprofits and foundations that are supporting us in bringing this programming to you. And if you are not already and feel so moved, please consider becoming a member of NOFA Vermont. We are a member supported organization and <clears throat> we have values that are shared by many Vermonters. Our primary work areas are here, <clears throat> supporting organic farmers, fighting climate change, building an equitable food system, making good food accessible to all, growing community. Mieko Ozeki is the former um, manager of the Burlington Farmers Market for many years and has um, a fantastic consulting business called Womenpreneurs. And I will let you tell us a little bit more about you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna actually turn off my video just so that uh, we can just focus on the presentation here. And you guys can see the screen, all right? Um, Great, so I'm happy to be here. And I'm, um, I wanna thank uh, Andrew and Maddie and Nova Vermont for um, inviting me to uh, talk about this topic that I'm pretty passionate about um, and also kind of the tools that I've brought uh, with me when I was at the Burlington Farmers Market. Um, so today we're gonna talk about, there's two parts to this um, workshop. So the first, this morning's workshop, um, we are gonna talk about going from direct to consumer. So whether you're at a farmer's market or you're selling in retail brick and mortar um, to then kind of translating that into digital marketing and what does that involve? Um, and so today's half, the first half, it's going to talk about the fundamentals of building a strong business brand online. And And so today's workshop, we're going to focus on kind of Broad, the, the, we're going to focus on website and um, and the pretty much um, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at uh, what the fundamental your, your base camp of all of your digital marketing is, which is um, kind of right foundationally. We're just going to be looking we'll be looking at websites. The second half of the presentation in the afternoon is going to look at social media and kind of how that amplifies your message online. Um, so we'll look at looking at, we'll do some of retrospective and looking at 2020 and in digital as well, looking forward and then also kind of understanding your brand. So we'll do a quick exercise around that. And then we'll look into your business online presence. So kind of, again, as I said, your website as your base camp of your information about um, your, what fundamentally of your business and what you have control of and messaging about your business. Um, then, then we'll look at the scope of building a website, the functionality or organizing content. And so whether you have your own website or whether you are looking to build a website, it's trying, what we're trying to do is build a mindset of design um, one, and, and, and how you would go about that. Um, and then we'll look at kind of really the, 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 um, Kind of the rudimentary stuff that you need to build a website and kind of look at platforms and everything else the other then we kind of lean into search engine optimization and so how do you make your site searchable as well as kind of making sure it's listed and people can find you and then finally the last parts of it is so when you go for, you go from creating maintaining to basically making sure managing your website and analyzing the effectiveness of your website so that's what we'll close out with and then that will lead into kind of the later in the afternoon as I said into the social media aspect so can I introduce myself again, as Andrew said, um, I am the former director of the Burlington Farmers Market. I had um, 
started there in like late uh, fall to 2019 and concluded in December 2020. Um, Part of my, my role there was helping the farmer's market through a transition um, to a new location, um, temporary location, and then kind of sitting, standing around to be able to be, get it through um, the, first, uh, the first wave of the pandemic um, and helping the market thrive. Um, I'm also, for the last 10 years, I've been the owner of Radiant Studios, which is a website and event production um, service um so i do everything from producing events doing marketing for it as well as then also helping folks build their website um and fundamentally the work i do is really organizing people's slots and putting it into a website um and then finally i'm also the co-founder of an organization called vermont womanpreneurs and we are a digital and live event production where we celebrate women entrepreneurship in the state so we do a lot of promotion of women-owned businesses um, that is mostly through right now in the, the midst of the pandemic through um, social media. Um, we also do Zoom meetings and networking meetings and we foster you know, connection and collaborations through our network. So first activity here. So if you are getting familiar with Zoom by now, um, hopefully you know where the chat box is. I love to hear what um, cup two things. What's your the name of your business? And then what is your digital footprint? Do you have a website? Do you have Instagram? Do you have any of those things? If you can, what you can do in that second part of the question is um, import, uh, write, uh, type out your website address as well as maybe your Instagram or your Facebook handle. And I like to use this as an opportunity for people to see in the room who is who what what sites are out there and for them to check it out and to know who's you know to be able to help boost your um, presence. So we can do that for the next couple of minutes if you can add that in the chat box. Number two. There we go. I like seeing who's in the room. Welcome. It is. Thank you. Welcome to Midnight Goat Farm, Trillium Hill Farm. I love seeing this and I like seeing, I've seen a lot of your websites. So this is really wonderful to see your presence. Who else? I mean, we have 30 somewhat people in the room, but this is a great opportunity again to share who, uh, where you guys are in the digital space. Nice. And I like some people who don't have a presence. That's, that's great. Wonderful. You can also sneak in there if you like, love, or like your website or not. <laughs> um, I always like uh, this is what I these are the parts sometimes people they love what what they have already and sometimes they don't or there's just some real big questions they have for, about it. Great. Keep it coming folks. And it's good and everybody else, you know, feel free to look through the chat and see who else is in the room. So I want to share with you kind of what I learned in 2020 um, from the pandemic, but also just overall as I reflect, I reflect back and thinking forward um, for the year ahead. So um, when I joined the farmers market, I, a good portion of our um, vendors had uh, websites. Some of them had okay, web, like uh, social media profiles. But overall, like websites was kind of a maybe about 60, 40 where people had their own web presence. Um, but I felt at the time I was like before the pandemic happened, I was like, I, I kind of really urged a lot of our vendors to um, have a presence, make sure you have a website, be prepared. Um, and then the pandemic happened and where the guidelines for um, being at a farmer's market was to be able to have um, some kind of ordering system so you can basically uh, pre-order your 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 um, produce or whatever products that became an urgent need and so because you couldn't physically be 
present at, at some some of these locate some places, but you need to be able to provide a service. Having a website was really an urgent need, um, and so. Also, on top of that, you have a confluence where because people were shut in, they really need they want to just shop online. Um, and that was that strong desire to do contactless shopping as much as possible. So being able to find somebody on a website was really important. Um, and, and so as I, I look forward into 2021, I, even as we have vaccines available, there really isn't a, any way to say, well, we, we can return to back to not having a presence. There really is going forward, you would need to have a website presence and then and also just having a social media presence. And I say primarily, you definitely need to have a website presence. Social media, that is that is an, um, kind of, I leave that up to folks if they want to, but I would say it's it's definitely a help. It's definitely helpful to uh, amplifying your business brand. So, um, but basically, looking forward. If you don't have a website, or if you do have a website, this is a good time to assess kind of the shape and form of it. So, we're one of the big things about a brand, right? Is that when you're when you are physically present at a dirt like dark marking, you're building your brand in person, right? It's one to one. Your people are gra gradually learning about who you are, what your business is, what your services are, what products you provide. And they instantly either have their input, right? They either share it with you or they share it on social media or they do word of mouth. They share about they talk about your business. So as most people are familiar with the brand is what people say, how they viscerally feel emotionally about your business, right? Whether directly or indirectly, directly being obviously in person, word of mouth, indirectly is this vacuous, this big void that we call social media or digital, right? They, they're the, the people you don't see, but basically are spreading the message about your product. So also a brand is recognizable not just because it's not just your, your name but it's also a logo it may be the way your product is stylized it may be just in general the way people describe your presence um, another way we like to say is like what's what people say you know when the doors close and you've let you've left the field so with that said we're going to start and our first exercise is going to look at what your brand is so I like doing this exercise with my clients. Um, I usually do this, um, I sometimes do this with small, much, you know, solo promoter businesses, as well as individuals who are trying to build a, a, a presence online. But we'll start here in terms of understanding what your brand is. I recommend having post-it notes, and this is probably the first blush at try attempting, attempting this. But what I would do is have of post-it notes or your notebook and you would and you can individually write on sticky notes kind of words that describe your business um, and i always like to say don't make a long paragraph on a three by three post-it note write one word or two words at most so if you could write three to five words that describe what is special about your business and we can go for that so if you could write Three to five words that describe what is special about your business. And we have two more questions after this, but let's start there. And the way I like to say some kind, some things that might pop up is whether, if, let's say, if you're an organic farmer, I produce organically. I do X. Um, I create refined um, a refined cheese or some an, uh, artisan cheese or some kind of process, something that you feel is distinguishing about your business, we're family owned, something like that. Next, think about what are three to five qualities of your products, right? So think you could either think about one product or the whole gamut of your products. What are the qualities that you think your products exemplify? And sometimes the way this um, exercise happens is that also like go with your gut. What is the first thing? What are the first words that come out? Just write them. Not even don't don't edit. It's just your opportunity to just spit out as many words that describe what your business is, what your quality of your your products are. 
And then guys, again, I'm also limiting you to three to five, but basically this is a starter of kind of doing market research on yourself um, and your business. Finally, give three to five words you hear from your customers on your business and or your products, right? What do you hear frequently from them? Is it about the quality? Is it about the friendliness of your service? Is it about um, is it about what uniquely you provide? What, how do they feel about having your product? I like doing this exercise. If you saw on the previous slide, and I know people, um, if you want, if you could see in the chat box, Andrews have, has piped in some of those, those questions, those three questions that I asked for you to kind of elucidate your um, descriptors. Um, I like doing this exercise partly because I like seeing those qualities and taking a, a 30,000 foot view, looking at your brand, right? And looking kind of your initial market research of yourself, right? Sometimes it's nice to take a pause and reflect on what is the brand that you have developed or creating wherever you are in your place in your business, right? Well, however many years you've been in your business. And to basically you, I like having a blank wall and I love sorting through what is the connection between all of those different words and what is what does it overall say about your brand. Part of this is going to be important throughout your digital marketing because when you look at those words, it, the question is always going to be, are those words reflected in this in the, the vacuum that is social media, right? And what or or your website. Do people get those same feelings when they they find your site, when they find your social media presence? Do they feel that from the images or the content that you are creating, right? So I wanna take this opportunity, if anybody wants to share your insights about your, and some people have shared over here, um, but if anybody wants to either type in the chat box or raise their hands if they want to share what are the quality, what are these the what are the words that come up when describing your business? If anyone wants to raise their hand, and Andrew, if you want to um, see if anybody's interested in sharing. And if you want to like raise your hand or type it in the chat box, that'd be great. This is kind of like to, like, nice to see what people find about this. I see one hand raised. Um, on I can ask Catherine to unmute. Here we go. Great. Oh. Catherine, I yeah, there you go. Oh, unmuted. <laughs> yeah. Me from my moonlight here at hair. I'm an elder still learning to use all this social media. And thank you so much for offering this. Um, my program, my farm is called the Scutney Mountain Horse Farm. And it, we are unique in that we partner with horses as teachers and healers um, to offer play, people a place uh, to come and be a community seeking healing for life skill, uh, for ADA, for people with differences especially, but also just have fun. But uh, my horses are wonderful healer teachers um, for people with differences, ADH, PTSD, Asperger's, addictions. Um, so I've been doing this kind of work for years, but I've been kind of hidden. <laughs> and and I, I know that to be able to continue to bring to bring in the resources I need to be able to keep feeding these horses and to be able to keep sharing this, I have to learn how to be, how to use this media as a presence to get the message out. So thank you for that opportunity. So before you go, I wanna make sure, so when, as you're describing, you gave me the kind of what your business, what, let me go to the third question. What, when people come like experience your work, what are the words that come up for them? What are three to five words that come up for them? And I've got already a mother that's brought three kids with challenges and who herself has ADH and is dealing with the stress of all this. When uh, she left most recently after a session with for her and her children, she messaged me and said, when I leave your farm, I always feel 
more peaceful and hopeful. Peaceful and hopeful. So those are the things that abound about your, your work. So I think that's, again, like that's where the imagery, that's where the, the t- what your, co- your content will be about. Peaceful, right? And harmony, all those things, especially in these stressful times, that's what comes out, right? Yep. I'm writing it so down. Thinking about it, then what is what presented? Great. Thank you very much, Catherine, for sharing. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for helping me, helping us all. <laughs> Um, I love uh, our mom, uh, let's see, what else do we have here? I, I love what uh, Danny, you wrote in terms of describing your business, you're at Salvation Farms, um, community rooted, farmer focused, system level services. That is huge, that's a very big level. So that's uh, when those terms are really a good start. And then you're gonna have to think about how, does, how, do, how do people feel that? How do they experience and understand farmer focus, community rooted? Um, Armando, I like your environmentally conscious whole farm approach, humane and ethical, um, great. And then again, what are the imagery that comes up? How do you see that where in your farm or where, wherever you are, where do you, how do you, how do you express that? Um, does anybody, one more person, if anybody wants to share, I really love to hear, hear your, your, uh, kind of your words that come up for you. Oh, Ellen, you want to unmute yourself. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you can see me, but um, I I'm not. Well, that's good because I'm not seeing me and that makes me happy. (laughs) So um, we're a project within our group. So that's where it's a little different. And we're nonprofit versus business. So we were founded during COVID. Um, Community Equitability Group is the name of our organization. And the project is called Resiliency Gardens Project. So basically what we did is um, we saw that there was food insecurity. We created... um, these resiliency garden beds, we got some good quality compost soil, organic seeds, we taught classes, and we created this incredible community. Um, so, and then we, we worked a lot with the word resiliency. So we played with RE a lot in our uh, branding. So we used resiliency is about recreating, resourcing, um, and I'm forgetting what the other uh, word that we use. Um, and um, also, you know, respecting the earth. Um, so we played around with that. But, you know, as I'm looking at the community equitability, it's definitely about um, building community and um, taking care of the earth and creating food security. And this concept of equitability within a community. Okay. Well, Ellen, you know what you did? I just wanna kind of hearken to one part that you did really well, as I, I love, I like, um, one of the things that it really speaks to uh, volumes for a brand is when you have something that's memorable, right? So you use re, right? Resilience, right? all you use a lot of re's starting so it's something that sticks for people right Mm because those are the values or the things they're saying so um that's one of the things i I know when i've worked on branding it's like what can i find as a single letter that i can then build a bunch of words that describes but that that sticks right because you hear repeatedly so um that's that's brilliant um Great. Uh, I'm going to go and proceed. So one of the things I want to go, go forward is when you come and elucidate these, these key words about your brand is, or about your business or what you even aspire, what your business or your organization is about, one of the things that I find helpful is to be able to share that initial research you have from the things that you've collected, all those keywords, that information, and writing it out and sharing it with people who are close colleagues or whether it's customers saying, here's what I understand about what we have done up to, you know, X, Y, Z years or how many months in our business, our organization, um, and 
I want to just share that back out. I want to just reflect that back. Is that what is, you're seeing? And then in return, kind of what would you add on to that? Because the more words you have to describe the impression that people have of your business, the more rich your, your content is. The more rich it is to describe your business, you know, in, in what I would say, digital marketing is its more, most passive way, an indirect way where people are reaching you and seeing what you're, what you're about. So I, I, I challenge you, it really doesn't take much. One of the things I've done as an exercise is you do this initial you know, post-it note research, and then you basically write a short paragraph asking for feedback from those folks and saying, here's what I understand, like this is what comes up for me. These are examples that I see how we do this. I would like to know, do you concur? And do you, what would you add on to that list? And you'll, it's unbelievable how rich the descriptors are when you get that feedback. And I'm gonna take a quick pause. If there's any questions for sure, I would say definitely uh, type in the chat box. I will get to more uh, addressing some of that. So, I, again, I was, I'm focusing on websites for this half of the session because um, I really see that websites are your virtual real estate on the internet. So it's your placeholder. It's also cheaper than probably having a brick and mortar. It's also probably more reasonable than just having like a spot when you're in a farmer's market or a farm stands, like having a physical location or being at a big event. So it is your, it also is, it lasts a lot longer. You can have, you can have, hold that space. Um, so it's all in the stats. There's over 313.3 million people in the US who use the internet. So that's more than, that's probably about close to almost, uh, most of 90% of the population. Um, on average, people use six hours and 42 minutes of, of spending their time online. I think probably with the pandemic, even more so. Um, we're, you know, we're stuck inside where a lot of us are and probably, you know, pulling through the, what, what, the internet. Um, and then kind of most other, a lot of people, they take in their information maybe through their smartphones. So on average per day, people are using, um, you know, the, their smartphones for, you know, close to three hours. And again, 50% 50 of, of the, the time spent online is through a mobile device. And that's for the age of, you know, for folks who are between 16 and 64. So that's where your customer base is. And you want to be able to address all, you know, have all the information out there for the, that audience. And well, based on latest surveys, you know, 84% of customers think a website makes your business look credible. So I don't know how many of you have probably done this, but you know, you've probably discovered or you read about a business and you probably, you may have Googled, tried searching for their website and probably, and if you didn't see their website pop up, then you kind of question, does that, does that business exist? Does that organization exist? So people expect you to have a website. Bar none, that's the basic thing that most people expect. A face, having a Facebook page is fine. Um, and so is having and using that in lieu of, of a website, but the realize that your audience is pretty limited and it has to, it depends on people being subscribers to uh, members of, of that social media platform to be able to channel, to be able to access it. So just keep in mind that, that you know, your website is a little bit more open. It's more manageable platform for people to be able to access uh, your organization. So why have a website and why is it essential? Again, it's a control of info and branding. So it's one of the few places where you can control the content and where, what, what's posted. You're the, you know, you are creating, you are also curating um, and you're collecting information. That's all about your organization and your business. It's reputable and trustworthy. So people want to see that you have, you know, your website has, you know, my, myfarm.com. They will, they trust that. Um, it's a great way to sell your products online. There's a lot of fabulous, fabulous tools out there for you to be able to sell your products. It's also more affordable than traditional advertising. I don't know if how many of you have gone through the experience of trying to advertise even in a local newspaper or, um, you know, seven days, you know, just buying that one spot, like one spot in, in the newspaper can pretty much be the equivalent of what you would pay for a year 
or more of, of having a website online. Um, it's easier to keep up to date. So basically, you know, if you particularly in, in the choice of platforms that you, you, you work with, it's easier to be able to add, subtract and, you know, and, and manage where the, co what content is on your website. And it's also an easy way to find new local customers, right? So sometimes people are just, um, you know, what, well, I don't know, you know, a lot of people probably you just Google or you just surf the internet and you just come out, you put in a word and sometimes, you know, a website pops up and you just go and go, well, maybe I'll just check it out. Um, if you understand about um, kind of like Google AdWords and all these other, other platforms that are doing advertising, it, your search can easily um, lead you to other websites and other services and products. And then that's based on the algorithms that are out there. Um, and, and, you know, since the advent of like, of the smartphones and everything else, we find that more, there are more internet users, more internet users who are mobile users. So 92% of all internet users are mobile users 82% of smartphone users, they look at products beforehand. So they're trying to do their research, right? They wanna see like where, if they were at a farmer's market, yes, they're gonna go and try it. But and sometimes people, you know, there are people who just search, what's this product? What's the reviews? I wanna know more about this place. Um, and two thirds of internet users use mobile apps to shop. And so that's the thing, whether they're using Shopify or, um, Square, they're using those e-commerce platforms. Um, and then 66% of all e-commerce shopping is done mobile on mobile devices. So again, but why, right? If you already have a website or you're stumped at building a, a, web, a website, you know, why is this really important? I still wanna get round to, it's a mindset to be able to see this as an essential tool to managing and creating your digital presence, your digital, you know, um, it's, it's just key to your digital marketing tools. Um, and as I said, your, your website is the base camp for all things that, you know, that are amplified by social media, by media reports. So think about when you go to, you read a press report or a review, right? Most of the things that people want is they'll read the review and then basically maybe say you can find XYZ farm or you can find XYZ service at www blah, 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 right? Like that's the best advertising campaign you can have of your, you know, in terms of um, being featured in an article. So you never want to leave without having that in your, in the signature of your, of a piece or your, uh, or in your email. Um, let me see. I'm gonna, I wanna say Michelle's, I saw you, Michelle, your, your questions. What are the best ways to gather intel from customers, in-person, paper survey, online, all of that. <laughs> um, so let me break that down. In terms of, um, you can gather intel in a variety of ways. You can do that through online surveys, but uh, honestly, I find that direct appeals, whether it's specific emails that you write to somebody and say, Here's what I understand about my, like, you know, um, about my, my organization, my, my business, you know, this is what I've got about. So I love to hear more writing a direct email and then whether you copy and paste and send that to individuals, the same thing, that's, that is actually much more helpful and you'll get a lot more richer feedback in person. That's also, you can just, you can, um, you know, one way I like to do it is like, Hey, this is what I understand by myself uh, about our business. I'd like to know. What, what's your insights? You can incentivize it maybe with like um, a prize or something like that, but it's always nice to gather that that intel in, in that format. Um, there are a variety of ways, but I think the more you get specific about like, what is the request? What are you asking them to give comment or feedback on the better, right? So um, in those, you know, those are, four, those are ways you can go about it. Does that help, Michelle? Uh -huh. I will. Yeah. Uh, I will definitely address it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, that definitely helps a lot. Um, I also have a question about the thing we said about emailing people. So I'm guessing mm -hmm. you're 
referring to emailing people that you like know as a regular customer and not just somebody right. like, someone who's comfortable with you emailing them because I just was worried about unsolicited emailing people yeah yeah I think I would say your loyal customers that you know so if you've been doing like in person with folks like you know you you know they have a relationship with them and you can trust that they could share with you what they what they love about your products um you know and whether that's also a colleague it's just always nice to get that reflective mirror to see what the impression that your your business is because it's so I think one reason why I did this the the branding workshops in the in, in the first place is to pull out all of the noise in your brain to just simplifying what is the words that come out that you that one you aspire or you project or also what you've also collected what are the what's the information that you hear about the impressions that people have about your business um we do um, when i do that we're exercise it's it's what we call mind mapping so we first get out all the information and then we start to map out what are the common themes and what are the things that you know just being able to see that 37,000 foot view map of what the connection is for your brand. Um, and so then we take that and then you just, you then regurgitate it, but you write it into a paragraph and you give a solid example. I understand that this is what, this is what I hear about my business. This is what I know, what I know that's associated with it. Am I missing a detail in here? Maybe that you see about my business. So making it personal is great. You can, in, in whether by email or saying it in person is really helpful. And Olivia, I'm going to address your next one about kind of hosting um, next, but actually we will talk about domains. Yeah. Um, so owning your domain, I'm going to start there before we go into platforms and content, but basically owning your domain is really important. So it is, um, you know, it's your .com, your .net, your .org, right? It's so important to get it, um, all different variations of it. Um, of whatever your organization's names, you know, do the search. Um, my heavy recommendation, um, I know there's a lot of great services. I know a lot of people go with GoDaddy because it's cheaper. Um, I've actually gone from moving away from GoDaddy to using something called hover.com, um, partly because, um, so hover doesn't, so all these domains or these domain um, businesses, they are leasing your domain name to you, right? So from a larger pool, and then basically you're paying for subscription service to be for however long period to be able to sit and lease that 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 domain name. Um, you never really own it, but you're basically subscribing to lease it and be able to have to, to use it. Um, so I always go for when um, I'm kind of being able to have that real estate, um, Oh, can you, I'll, I can give that to you, Alan. Um, basically, having a domain is like base carving out your real estate in the digital world, right? Your your name, your placard, it's unique to your organization. No one else can uh, can uh, own it or use it, so you get to hold on it. Some people buy a lot of domains to sit on it um, and not use it. Um, and so it can up, it's kind of like a, the back end of it is it's like a stock market for um, basic for, for your, for your, your business name. Um, can you define, give a word, a few word de definition domain of, of or fewer definition of domain? Yeah. So domain again is it's, it's your placeholder, right? For your business in the website. Um, so whatever .com, .net, that is your placeholder with that where where you get to be in the area. Um, and again, as I said, you're leasing and you're not ever owning that domain. I always recommend folks to have different variations. Um, I have I always recommend folks have different variations of your domain. So whether that's .com, .net. Uh, one of the things when I was uh, joined the Burlington Farmers Market, we um, we only owned .org, and when .com, which was uh, somebody was holding it for a very expensive price, managed to just drop it because they didn't and they didn't want to hold on to it anymore. I bought it right away, um, just because I wanted to be able to sit on and make sure that every time 
um, whether people look up burlingtonfarmersmarket.com or they look up .org, because some people don't, they don't know which is which, at least it all redirects to the same website. So being able to hold on to that, those different variations is important. Um, <laughs> they, thanks, Andrea, for, for defining it. But basically it's, it's yeah, so, um, and also it's really helpful, whether for your website or for your email to be able to have your domain associated with it. So the scope of your website, you know, the prep before building or even as you look at your website, you know, whether you, uh, you hire a developer or, D, you know, you do it DIY, these are really helpful in understanding the scope of your, your website. Um, you can save as somebody who works on website development and has worked with like coders and everything else. The more you do the upfront analysis of what you need from your website and what you want it to, how you want it to function, the aesthetics of it, how you're going to message through it, the easier it gets to get that site developed. One of the things that when you you vacillate, if you vacillate too much on what the scope is of what your site is going to be the more expensive it's going to be with uh, work, working with a, a developer. So that said, um, when you're looking at your, your, the scope of your website, you should think about the functionalities of it. What are, will the customers get from visiting your website? Are they there to shop? Are they there to, under, uh, to uh, learn more about your business or your organization? What are they getting out from it? The other part on the back end side is, what will you what will you get from customers who visit your site? Are you collecting their emails so you can to can send in uh, in newsletters? Are you trying to get them to shop or even get to um, peruse your catalog of all of your of your products or services that you provide or learning more about your organization? The other part is then to think about your aesthetic, right? So one thing overall about a brand is what's what's the the, what's the environment you're creating, the mood, the tone, whatever it may be that, that, that gets people to understand what your brand and your business is about. So what's that visual presentation look like? What's the imagery? What are the colors? What is your logo? All of those things are the, that are, that's part of it. And finally, the message is kind of, what is the message you're trying to convey to new and returning customers, right? that you are, are you in being more informative, providing different pieces of information? Are you here to let people just get a, a taste and understanding of what your, your products or your services are? Are they trying to get familiar with your process, your stories? So those are the kind of what you're trying to convey of like, how do you, how do you, how are you going to message for your website? And then what format is that gonna take? whether it's having a blog on your website, whether it's just um, having more video content or having pictures or other, in, other imagery in there. So as you see on the right-hand side is kind of like a nice little example of like when you're, when people, when you're thinking about the layout of your website, you're thinking about both function and aesthetic and form, right? What is what's happening here? And so the, what I like is this one shows the examples of you know, your, lo your logo, if there, is there a navigation window? Is there social icon, social media icons? Is there video content? What do people experience when they, they, uh, they see your site? Uh, th this example is also kind of what people think about is why, what they call wireframing. So kind of what would people, the user experience of seeing your website and how they, they navigate through it. So this is one of the parts I like doing with clients is I do I take do a little bit of brand exercise and then I try to do kind of website architecture, right? So I think about the overarching navig like overarching what is the what is the, what is the business trying to present? What information do they have? How do they how are they going to maintain and upkeep their website? So all of that is embedded in when thinking about the architecture of navigating through a site. So in essence, what you're doing leading up to working, whether we were working with a developer or doing it yourself, is collecting and curating content first, right? I always advise that. So some of the things is like 
collecting, you know, locating and organizing content like your photos, you know, of your products, articles that may have been written about your product, any testimonials, links to that, that for folks to learn about, um, to, to learn about your product. Um, the then I would then I go forward with like once I know that what folders it get put in and then how I kind of like do some really quick um, idea of like what the layout would look like how is it going to function in in the in in the website I outline the site navigation so normally when you have a site you have main menu items I always say it's too cluttered if you go beyond five and at least three of them are already going to be occupied. One is going to be a home page. What's the main landing page? So when somebody clicks in um, BurlingtonFarmersMarket.org, that's your home page. It's the first landing page that people will go and see. I generally have an about or bio page so people can get familiar, kind of, um, or just a, a, a folder where they basically all all pages that are associated with talking about your organization, your business, your process, all of those things are in. And finally, kind of a last, a, a last navigation is to your contacts. How can people reach you and learn more about your, uh, your uh, send more information about your, your business and, and inquire. And then, then there's also sub pages and, and then how that is gonna be designed is we'll be determining kind of what kind of content you have is you have evergreen content. So content you don't change or static content. Um, so that might be your about page um, or dynamic content. So things that always are changing, like a blog post, which has the most up-to-date uh, content, an event calendar, um, all of those things. And that's organized under the main navigation. And then creating a page layout. So basically you're adding content and you're embedding features. So it may be static, as I said, static. It could be just text and or things that just don't change place like uh, images that don't that don't rotate or dynamic. You can have a gallery, um, you can have a directory, some things that kind of always change because there's you're always uh, updating it in some other place. I'm gonna pause there. If there are any questions so far in regards to website architecture. So talk about content. Um, so content, you know, photos, video, article, testimonial, these are the things that you're collecting. Um, so when it comes to photos, um, one of the things I sh that is a struggle for people if it doesn't is, is getting low resolution pictures of your product or your service. You wanna have things that are um, really well, uh, like are not granulated, um, or not intentionally, but you know, or unintentionally granulated, um, as you can have artistic pictures and whatnot. But um, just really high quality photos that kind of really express what your um, what your product or your service or just about your farm or your just in your your business environments. Um, so you want to be able to have really good photos for that um, video. Obviously, I think there's a there's a in social media you could have a mix of like low you can you could hood have some low quality, but overall it's really beneficial on your website to have um, well edited um, content that is um, you know you can still do that from your phone, but well edited content that expresses the brand values that you have kind of explored uh, in the earlier parts of this uh, workshop. So making sure you have that and and posting it in video platforms um but online articles so this is a great place where you know if there has been articles that have been written about your organization um or your your business you know collect that i think that's real what folks don't realize is that sometimes they just forget that that's out there and um they don't utilize it the full power of it by collecting all that information in one place, you make it easier for people search outside of a Google search about your business. So having those links to those articles or reviews or features about your business makes it easier for people to explore that. And, and we'll talk later about your search engine optimization. It just makes it like where it heightens the listings 
about um, search in, in terms of searching about your business, you know, in that first couple of pages of your Google search. And testimonials. So, you know, whatever you hear, whether it's via email or in person, if there are testimonials that people can provide or reviews about your uh, about your product or your business, that's a place where you can also post all that content. Um, in terms of content integrations, as I mentioned, video. So you could go to, you could post videos in YouTube um, where the video content, it goes out to a wider audience. Um, it could take, you could have long format, but most people's attention spans are pretty short. So, um, you know, anywhere between, you know, under a minute to, you know, to 15 minutes is where most people's attention spans hold. Um, but, you know, developing, putting, putting video content up there. Um, I also like Vimeo, um, where you could create a whole profile of all the video content. Not, this is usually where you have uh, video, videographers. They post a lot of videos. Um, there's a lot of farm and other uh, food content that is out there. Uh, but they, it's high quality. Um, but Vimeo has got a, a less, a, a limited audience compared to YouTube, but they are both of these platforms are both, um, they can be integrated in a lot of websites. Um, and then social media, like, again, you can integrate, uh, embed things. Most of the times you can embed um, a Twitter, your Twitter uh, or your Facebook, like uh, what commentary and posts are coming uh, through there. And then also Instagram kind of photos that you post on and, and Instagram, you can integrate into a website. So you have two options. Um, and I always wanna be able to discern these two different, uh, two, two different uh, ways of approaching a website. You can go the custom um, route which means it's coding and it's basically those customizations are put together for the functionality or aesthetic that you can't specifically get or have the time to build um, for your website. Uh, and so a lot of that, those customizations are doing the you know, traditional HTML code, just coding in the background, um, WordPress, uh, which is an open source uh, platform, also uh, through like Drupal, there's a, a there's Python, there's a bunch of other uh, uh, coding platforms that are open source and um, that people get mostly web developers to put together. Or your op second option, which most people can start out with, it's in DIY, or you can also hire folks who work in those platforms is all in one platforms. Um, they're user friendly, they already have, templates and function features that most businesses need. So the pros and cons. So the pros of, 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 of a customization is that you can get, you get a website with customized features and functionality. Um, the cons of that is that you rely on a web developer or to maintain, um, maintain the site with, and especially whenever there's a platform update. So something like WordPress is an open platform and, uh, Basically, it it if you got a template through um, that your web developer got through or like WordPress, oftentimes at some point your site breaks because the the code is updated, the whole platform updates, and so the whole entire template needs to be updated. Um, so and generally with customizations, you have to buy your services separately for hosting, domain, and platform subscriptions. So you'll have to pay three, maybe three different prices. Whereas if the option for two, which is all in one platforms, and I'll talk about those specifically next, um, you don't need to know code. Um, I mean, it, it's helpful sometimes if you had a rudimentary HTML code and understanding that, but, but most people you're already, when you look at Gmail or anything else, you're working with a WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get. Um, you all, you know, whatever you type is, is, is exactly what appears on your site. Um, your, these platforms are closed looped. Um, and so they are updated frequently. So whenever there's an operations update, they, the, all your template won't break or your site won't break because the updates are happening in the background. Um, and then hosting domain and platform are part of the subscription. Um, and, and that's just kind of the appeal. It's also more reasonably priced. I would say you, 
really big customizations can cost thousands of dollars. Um, and you can probably spend less than a thousand dollars or even less than five hundred dollars being, you know, uh, taking part in a, an all in one platform. The cons, um, you know, just that maybe you just don't like specifically the templates or features that are offered in that platform. Um, and there's probably others, but I would say majority of people are going this route since they've been uh, these all in one platforms really came to fruition in the last decade. So I'm going to specifically talk to all in one website platform because I think majority, as I saw in 2020, a majority of folks can go this direction because all you really need is a place to, to house the content is that it's about you, just really more static information that is evergreen information about your your business and your organization, um, some place to place to uh, put photos, and then also kind of just general general needs are you know whether it's to sell things or to get uh solicit um subscribers for your your email uh account then that's uh for your email uh, campaigns then that those are the things that they already offer um so squarespace and weebly wix and wordpress so as I mentioned, um, WordPress has two different um, kind of platforms. They do have an, a closed loop all in one platform uh, that you can select a template and build in. Um, and then also then they have the open source one, which is basically where a lot of developers can customize a website for you. Um, most of the clients I've had have all run away from WordPress because at some point it gets, it's just overwhelmingly confusing and, and to organize. Um, so I've, my, my, I, I, my preference, and I only primarily work in Squarespace, um, just because as a platform, I found that is very friendly in terms of all the different features. They expand their features, um, and, and through kind of more sophisticated tools that they offer, but at the same time, it looks elegant, um, and presentable. Um, a lot of people in the kind of the, this, this past year, um, in the rush to build a, a site and and but also wanting to sell online and being prepared for uh, just kind of people shopping online, most people have gone to there's there's a lot of e-commerce platforms, but the two that have that really come up are Square and Shopify. Uh, Square is as you many of you are familiar with the Square processors. They um, uh, you can develop a, a website on there. You can put your inventory and then it basically, tr it, it's great because both on your mobile, when you're selling, you're selling things uh, in person or online, you can sell products that way. Um, and then Shopify is another one where you can also build a website. And each of those are tied to the, some of the all-in-one platforms already, but basically the, the dominant part of those, those platforms is the 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 commerce plot the commerce feature um, above kind of all the other features that are that are in the all-in-one platform so um so that's kind of the main focus of those uh so peggy great question what do i think about um big commerce pros and cons i would say it depends on um i would say Okay, I guess the pros of a big commerce is if you're just looking for one aspect to do, like you just want to sell a product um, and you want to you, you want to simplify it to be aligned with the, the credit card processors, all those things that you're using, then using those platforms like Shopify or um, or Square make it really easy. What I like too about Square and and, um, and Shopify is that you can also do like gift cards and everything else. Um, or big pro, sorry, big commerce and WordPress. I, yeah, I'm not really familiar about that, but but I guess I would say in general, um, yeah, I guess in general, I would say e-commerce it is a really helpful tool if you already have like a, a certain processor that you're you're using. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with WordPress because again, I stay away from WordPress just because um, a lot of folks I know just they have a hard time working with it. But if you're, you're successful with WordPress, it's awesome. Um, 
So one of the things that's really important about your design of your website is that it has to fit multiple screens, right? As I pointed out early on, a good portion of people shop online via their mobile site. So it's important to be able to know that your site can really fit into a smart screen or an iPad, um, but mostly, or a tablet, a tablet screen. Um, not a lot of people use desktop, uh, in term, you know, in in reference to kind of the total number of people who who go on the internet, but um, it's always good to make sure that your your uh, content right sizes onto um, those different screens. So as I said, seventy three percent of mobile internet users will switch out of site if it's poorly designed. So if your site does not shrink down from desktop to mobile and realigns itself to be able to fit text and images, people will just navigate away from your site. Um, and 52% of mobile internet users are likely to engage with the company and brand if the mobile experience is, or, or likely to not engage with a company or brand if the mobile experience is bad. Um, so again, the way, how can you tell whether your, your website is mobile or tablet friendly? Take your browser, and if you're on your desktop, take your browser of your website and then, in, 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 sorry, in your browser and in, in open your website and then basically kind of resize your, your browser window to be about the width, the size and width of, of your, uh, of a phone. So basically elongated in, in a rectangle. And if the, if the site doesn't kind of adjust itself, it's not, and all you see is kind of it's it, the words or the images kind of go go off the screen. Then it isn't. Um, it's not a mobile ready site, and that's why what I, I also the other preference of using a um, uh, an all in one platform is the majority and actually pretty much all of them can run right size to the a, a screen that is like a mobile screen or a tablet screen. Um, okay. So the other part too in your website is you your primary call to action. And so one of the things I, I really spent a lot of time this past summer um, and leading into winter and talking to vendors and talking to different um, businesses is your, or your call to action or your CTA is, is to basically get newsletter subscriptions and to hold that list of emails that are coming from um, customers. So that's, that gives you the potential when you build up that list to be able to inform people about launching a new product or maybe an event that's coming up, just so letting people know, but you have that customer list and it's the more direct, you know, outside of the, the, when with direct marketing, we don't necessarily collect all of those names and we don't, you know, uh, know all those customers, but what's nice about doing e these, uh, subscription, uh, uh features is that, basically allows people to uh, enter their email address because they want to be in the know about what's going on with your business or your product. Um, obviously the services that are out there kind of outside of a website, uh, outside of your an all-in-one platform or constant contact, MailChimp, and there's a whole variety of other services. Um, and then kind of some, some of the uh, all-in-one websites have their own um, newsletter subscription um, and newsletter production uh, uh, features. So Squarespace, I know, um, Squarespace, I definitely know has a, 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 a email marketing um, feature in it. So let me walk you through uh, I'm, I'm the, one of the websites I worked on. Um, other than uh, Burlington Farmers Market, I just recently uh, completed the Capital City Farmers Market um, website, and I can walk you through that. But I, uh, I'm loving <laughs> I'm looking at the, the input from folks. Again, I, I've heard the same, same commentary from a lot, of, uh, a lot of past clients about WordPress. Um, that it, it is also because it's an open source code is vulnerable to uh, malware and all kinds of other things. So it doesn't work, but also just creates more havoc than anything else. Anyone have any questions so far? Great, I'm gonna navigate through the capital city. Um, oh, haven't launched because of WordPress. Uh, okay, so Nick, great question. I haven't launched uh, because of WordPress, any idea of how to change over. So two things, 
how do you divorce yourself from WordPress if you don't love your experience? One, um, make sure you can separate your domain. So if you're, if WordPress is hosting, a, a, you got your domain through WordPress, try contacting them to be able to transfer your domain to a different service. Um, and I recommend again, hover.com and they make it really easy. You can, um, there are easy step-by-steps of how to transfer your domain out. Once you transfer your domain out, that means that you can are open to building your site somewhere else and then connecting your domain to that site. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, Nick. But most of the times it's it's all about divorcing yourself from uh, your domain from the service and transferring it over to a different domain service or to an all-in-one platform. Although I highly recommend doing it with a third-party domain service because um, uh, because basically that, then that way you can just connect it to any 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 website at any point in time. So um, you know, one thing that is if you did develop a WordPress site, um, I think so through WordPress.com or .org, I can't remember which one, which is the, um, no, .com. Um, if you open one through there, your site kind of always is there, but you can always, you can cancel your subscription, but it always exists. You, you always exist as a user. Um, you never really can get rid of that. It's kind of a really odd way to get try getting yourself out of it. Um, what tabs, couple of cool things on a website are nice to have or important food systems related website? Um, I, know. Uh, I would say what's it's with a food systems related website, I would say having maps. So anything like a directory to information um, for people to find more information about food systems, um, just being um, able to uh, kind of get that information, drive them to, to different pieces of content. Um, I basically think just being able to this goes back to website architecture, doing an outline of like in, of the sub page of net main navigation and then sub pages of how do you break up food systems? And FAQs is definitely, yes, read is really important. Um, okay, so let me walk you through uh, the capital city farmer's market and hopefully you guys can see this um, just to navigate you. So as I said, um, we try having less than five, but um, again, we'll see, as uh, you'll see in the, through the navigation here. And I just wanna make sure, uh, Andrew, we could still see the, the web page, right? Yep, we can see it. Yes. Awesome. All right, so um, as you can see, some people like they'll have um, their main page as their, uh, their home page is usually part of the navigation. But in the way we do this, um, we I built this again in um, Squarespace. The if you click on the logo, that it goes directly to the main page. You don't really see it here in the main navigation. Um, in your home page, it's a night. I like the way to, to describe it. it it's um, your home page is almost like a newspaper. It's kind of like that first page of the newspaper of all their different sections that summarizes what is the definite the additional stories that go in further further into other pages so you know in here we have a link uh talks about uh, with uh we it goes to a directory that shows uh who is going to be present at the farmer's market here we have a whole gallery of images to kind of give people an impression and an idea of what the montpelier farmer's market is about we give a location you people we have a page that goes to directions um, we have a contact form so people can learn how they can get involved with the market. And then, as I mentioned, you can integrate things like social media. So here we have is uh, we integrated the, uh, uh, their, their Instagram. Uh, and then at the bottom, we have both locate or what's an address, who, how you can get reach the, uh, an email address for how you can reach the, the manager and then a subscription. So this subscription ties, uh, is stored whenever somebody enters their email, it's stored in a Google spreadsheet as a backup and then also goes to um, a MailChimp server or also can go to Constant Contact. Um, as you see the little icons here, uh, this allows you to uh, email the person, uh, email the, the admin. It also lets you go to their Facebook page as well as their Instagram. 
this way it directs traffic all in one page. So that's the home page. Um, and then as you go into static content, so we they have their history, we have their images, we have long form text. This mostly is evergreen, so it doesn't really change and get edited uh, often. Um, in terms of vendors, what we did was an integration of a directory. So things like, again, like that food systems um, website, you know, if you had a directory of resources or people, you could create the, you could create those as a list. Um, here we use and embedded a tool called Community Box. Um, so it allows us to create profiles. We can turn on and off things. It also has an integrated map to locate where all of those different businesses are. Um, what we do here too is that for people's easy search, we have tags that are associated with each of these businesses. So people can search by those tags so they can go through that. They don't have to go through the entire list. So by their shopping experience that they would like to have. Um, each of these also links to their, uh, their uh, different uh, social media feeds. So you can go and look at that all within the site. One of the goals of having a creating these this content here in the set and inside the site is to keep people as long as possible um, on the website and and engaged, right? You want them to spend more time on your website and before leaving it. Uh, we did the same kind of directory for the winter vendors. And this way, actually, for the manager, what she gets to do is on a daily basis, she can turn on and off and switch show who is and is not attending the uh, farmer's market. And then again, these are all different. These are all different pages that in the home page we direct to. We have a contact form. Um, again, at the end of the day, your contact form should do two things: not only message you um, from from that that individual uh, who's reaching out to you, but also should be collecting emails in the background so that you have you start to build your list. Um, if you're in, in, in um, there's also kind of the privacy walls in, and you could turn on these features so that it could turn, uh, you know, people could do a, a double, they can opt in or out of being part of your email list. Um, so again, and this is in your footer. So you have your header and your header up here. And then in the bottom, you have your footer. So these are things that don't change the top and the bottom. All right. I'm gonna walk through. And one more site we'll go through. Um, we're gonna then we'll look at a custom site. So this is um, Maple Wind Farm. And they did a custom site. So they worked with a platform that is primarily focused. So actually you, what I like about this one is they have their website has a pop-up, um, allows people to subscribe to their newsletter list. So then it makes that it's an automatic uh, action that people will either type it in or not, but most people will because it pops up. Um, but basically this is a customized site on a platform that is really built around an e-commerce platform. Um, but it's really nice because you can look at the site and this is the home page. It really what's geared towards is, you know, the shopping experience, getting you to their catalog and to shop. Um, they get to talk to you about what's new in this section and what products they do. They can integrate video. So here again is YouTube. Um, so and, and gives you the ability to kind of view it in the site, but also share that content. You can read more about the farm. So again, go leads to a page, this, and then it, again, you can go shop here. So pretty much everything is all on one page. Again, also the example too is test, testimonials or reviews, what people say about their products. Again, there, and then, then people can apply for a job. Again, email list is here, logo, where their location is, their social media, and then kind of all these other, uh, they can have a privacy rules or you can have any uh, things kind of describing, you know, regulatory stuff that you need on there. And so, um, so this is another example of, of a, this is a custom website, but it's built on a different uh, e-commerce platform. All right. So can you speak to any, okay, Olivia, you asked, can you speak to any recommended tools for customer scheduling via the website? 
like with pick your own or all the COVID protocols we are scheduling farm. Yeah, so there's a variety of ways. I think some people have used like where they, um, you know, you can use like event, people have like tooled this a little bit differently. You can use Eventbrite, um, you could use, um, uh, you could probably do, a, you know, lead to a form and then people would be able to pick. You could use Doodle. Um, basically, it's a link that goes out to another site to be able to do that scheduling. Um, actually, what I thought was Maplewin really what they had a, a, a great tool when they did Thanksgiving, um, they had integrated into the form in their shopping experience what time slot people would, would go into, um, would go and pick up their uh, turkeys. Um, so it depends, like some, some websites have that integration where it's like if you have a form for when, pe when people are doing their shopping experience, they can select what, what they're doing. Although I would say it's still manual because you're still coordinating what times are available unless you put, um, you're able to, in those fields, say you only have X amount of spots to be able to do a pickup time um, where you can turn on and off those selections. Hopefully that helps. Um, but those... A lot of people have cobbled different things um, to be able to to schedule the schedule that many people. Um, Doodle may be your best part where you could, or some other other scheduling platform where you could basically say, here's how many slots we have available. Um, another one I would say, yeah, was, yeah, those are pretty much ones I can think of. Uh, and then, yeah, anybody else have a question? Right. It's good, yeah, Square appointments, sign up genius. There's a lot of people, especially in this time, I'm listening to the, my colleagues in the farmer's market world, they've been just using a whole bunch of uh, a scheduling apps to integrate. So kind of want to take a back, looking back at what the earlier exercise we did and looking at your website, you know, your, if you have a website, really looking through and say, does your website align with the brand qualities that you're trying to transmit, whether it's the aesthetic, the way the information is organized? Um, and then those who are thinking about building a website, like how would you organize? What's that outline for, for, for your website? So, you know, taking that uh, assessment would be great. Anybody have any thoughts about their current website or, or what, how they would want to organize their site? I'm happy to this. I'm going to take this moment. I'm happy to do anybody if they want a real time review of their site. I'm happy to open it up or any to any questions. Okay, great. So let me I can talk about SEO. Danny about, um, so we're having, we're, we think our website works fine, but we're having trouble with SEO and getting it to be on the first page of Google. Yeah, okay. There is a workaround on that. On that. Um, let's see. Olivia, do you want me to look at your site? Looks like it. So let's do that. Great. And you, Olivia, you can uh, turn on your mic if you want to tell me about a little bit about your site. Um, so we have no skills in terms of websites and we are just starting farmers. So literally that we just set up as a business last year. Um, mm -hmm. And so we use like one of those programs that does everything for you kind of, and mm -hmm. you just add the pictures. Um, mm -hmm. You know what platform you used? Mm, my husband set it up. I, don't know. <laughs> I just did editing. Um, right. Yeah. So it's, you know, this is, uh, it, it's a great way to scroll through one of the, again, I said the test, right. Is, is, is it, it's, is it, uh, 
you, is it friendly? Is it you, is mobile friendly? And the answer is no. Ah, uh, okay. If you see, do you, does it, you see the, what I mean here? So if you yeah. basically take your browser, that's what somebody on a mobile phone will see. Okay. So if it was, uh, see, so to the extent this would probably work for tablet. The issue though, is that it does not adjust, sorry, does not adjust for mobile. So what would happen is all your navigation would go into a singular, would, would come into a singular fol file folder. Um, and then basically it just, it would, it would, it, you, you would see it, like it, the, all the content would adjust. So it will stack on top of each other. See, when so, I open it on my iPhone, it, it smushes, like it, yeah. it goes into the frame. Right. Hmm. It can. Most of, I mean, that's, I guess, let me see again. Yeah. Generally when we do this test, it's like, it, it, that's what how people would see it. It, it is kind of adjusting, but not a lot. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm not sure. And actually, I could source code where that there is content or what the platform is. Um, great. So you have your in terms of your navigation, you have uh, some nice uh, like you limited it to um, a few navigations. I think the missed opportunities maybe. I guess you only have single. Oh, everything's on one page. That's nice. Um, I would say here, if there's an opportunity to hide your home and then have your logo, that would be great. Hide your and um, and the way you would do that is there, if whatever platform they might be able to have a way for you to hide the link, but it's still public to be able to show this page. So people, whenever they go, go into your um, your web page, they'll be able to still go to the land on this page, but it's just not going to be like up here in the front because this is a little okay. bit of a waste of navigation real estate. Yeah, yeah. Um. And then contact us. So is this, where is, does, uh, where does the uh, contact go to? Like, does it go, the email so, just go straight to you? Well, right now that just sends an email into our email account. Like, yeah. so we need to figure out some way to have it a little more automated. So mm -hmm. it's not me getting an email and then being like, okay, let me put this in the spreadsheet. Okay. Let me put this in MailChimp. Like so one quick way, I mean, in the short term, short, short term, um, and I don't know which platform, the short term would be that this goes, you could use something called Zapier in uh, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com. And what it does is it does, it creates a zap. So whatever it will say uh, between this app and this app, this actually will happen. So whenever somebody enters, uh, contacts me and they enter their email address, it will go straight to a spreadsheet, whatever it may be. The, at, and the next action is, it, and then it will go to this spreadsheet and will go into these fields and, and you can collect stuff. Um, ah, so okay. that's one solution. Only it, it's a little bit of a headache because you have to kind of really be very regimented about thinking about like action A leads to B and then the outcome is C. So you have to be very regimented. That's why it's kind of nice to have some of the all-in-one platforms where it automatically stores that for you. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I would say that's my quick feedback. And then if you, you, uh, the one thing is that, you know, the text is a little bit small. So I think when you do a Google search, we'll do is it'll just, uh, the, one of the things that might come up if you, um, sign up for Google analytics is that the text may be an issue, um, because it's small Okay. And navigation and everything else. So that might come up as your, as an issue. That's my quick analysis. Um, oh, I'm gonna get Thanks. to the next part, which is because I mean, I'm looking at time. We are talking about uh, the SEO, so we'll talk about all those things. Um, so I'm gonna go here. So once you've launched your website, this is what's gonna play into your SEO. So um, once you launch and announce your site, you're going to connect it to your domain, right? Um, again, what I like, again, about something like hover.com or anything else, they have easy integration of being able to connect your domain to your website, and then um, you're officially public. Once you your website is public, um, some people or like the biggest complaints I hear from the clients is like, I can't Google it and I can't find it um, like in, in on the web. And it's there, it's public. There are, um, there is a workaround on Google 
where you can kind of get it um, seeded into a search pretty much earlier than normal. Um, and it, it's a little bit of a work, a, a little bit of a rigmarole to sign up for, so sign up and then and integrate it. The, one of the easiest ways, and this is where it goes into search and job optimization, is announcing it. Announce your website, share it with as many friends as possible to open up your website, look through your website. So it starts, the algorithm starts to pick up that your site is being viewed a lot and starts putting it in listings. Um, Announce and share the link of, yeah, so again, you, you're going to share that through e email or through social media. As in, that's what, as I mentioned, that part of your search engine optimization, again, the, the simplest tactic is to get folks to click as much as possible on your website and any positive content about your organization. So whether you're sharing that through your social media, while you're sharing it through your website, some way you have to get people to directly click on that, spend time looking at that your website or that content to be to, to look at it. The other part is your content on your website should have the most search terms that um, that to, to, to be picked up through the algorithms. Um, one of the great things about some of these all-in-one platforms is that they have m nodes in there that you can be able to say, um, so I, I know this more for Squarespace, but you can look at um, a blog post or some page of content and there is a feature there that says, how do you want to improve your SEO? You can pretty much do things like write the keywords that are associated with that page and like hopefully they're very popular and the most searched. Um, you can also, you, know, you can also go in on, um, uh, the other thing I'll do is that um, you can also write the summary. So no more than like two lines to describe what the page is and hopefully has some, it's keyword friendly so that people are, are looking for those terms, but basically that describes what that page is about. Um, and then also you could do things like uh, you could, go on um, different search terms, like on like Google online, like what's the most popular thing about X? Um, and it'll, you know, you'll see in Google, it will fill it in for you. And then just making sure you integrate that into your, your site. Um, I, I say, do you recommend that you, that you do see keywords for every item on your e-commerce site? Um, no, I, I would say, you know, I would say what is the, I would say it, it's good to have it. So SEO, like those keywords are not always blatantly on in your descriptors or anything else. They're actually, sometimes you can in, embed that in the feature and then you could be able to um, embed that in, into the content. So it's, a, it's part of the descriptor about that content, but it's not in your main text that people see. Um, and that's part, let me describe that. Uh, so. So, sorry guys, I'm gonna go through the back end looking. This is my, uh, one of her newer's website. So the way we do this is how we organize pages. Um, as I said, we have a, a directory. We have a, 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 this is our main navigation. And when I look at content, um, there is this feature called SEO. So I could write, this is what it, right now in the search engine results, the preview, what it has is like, it's just, it's about page and then you can write your descriptor. I can, you know, orient it and say, uh, you know, this is about uh, women-owned businesses and write it in the descriptor and write, it's, and write keyword heavy stuff in here. And then you can hide, you can, it can be, this will be picked up in search results. Um, some, again, I'm more familiar with, with Squarespace, but basically this is a, one of the tools they have and it's really effective in how you um, get your search terms uh, looked for. So it's all more in the descriptor of your content than it is in, um, in actually writing in your, in your, on that page directly. Um, and let's see, and then, yeah, in terms of your commerce size, your inventory, sometimes it the only way you use uh, keywords is more for people using it filters, and then it's those kind of populate uh, on on search to look for those particular items. 
So like that directory, you know, what I did was I, I, I got as much uh, keywords from all the different about the products so that people could filter it. And then a lot of people, when they're searching, they can find those keywords associated with that business. So analytics is really important. And again, why I like the all-in-one as much as possible. Because uh, I like the all-in-one platforms is a lot of them have these kind of features where you can do the analytics. So once you have your launch, website launch, you can do a little bit more detail oriented looking on what um, what the traffic is, where people, where the, where are people searching, where, what kind of devices they're using, all that stuff, what content is really popular. And so this is uh, the back end um, of last year of what the uh, Burlington Farmers Market website, when we launched, it talked about how many visits. Um, so how many visits came, uh, uh, visitors looked at the website, um, what, how many of them are unique visitors. So, um, and unique media visitors means it's identified by their IP address. So, uh, you know, when you're, you're, you're yeah, from your home, your router has a specific address. So it can identify who is a unique viewer of, of that um, content down to your computer. So you can basically know who is a unique visitor to your site. Um, talks to, you know, then I could see over time the trend of how many people are seeing. Obviously you can see here in April, we relaunched a whole new website and so this is again when by the time we hit June, this is what happened. Um, we were getting a lot of traffic because people were trying to figure out like what was happening with the, the farmers market. Um, you could see what browsers are people are viewing, viewing your content, um, what operating systems that they're using. Um, there's a lot of really great rich analysis. And I said here you could see of the 40 close to 42,000 visits to our website, a majority of them are mobile. And then, uh, and then a, uh, the next portion was desktop and then small bit was tablet. So this analysis is really helpful because you can see where people are looking um, at your content on your website, right? And then um, when you dig further here, the back end of looking at Squarespace, I can look at like what pages, where they're looking and where, and also like geographically where they're looking, they're looking from and also what, um, Specific, like what specifically, like how long they're spending on that content. So, you want to get if you want to get really granular and understand the user's behavior of your uh, website. Like, are, you know, some people think like I have one way of thinking about how my people are navigating my website, and then it totally is different. Um, I, you can look at a, a, one service that I've used in the past and it's kind of weird, but it's, it's amazing. Um, it's Hotjar. So you can see the behaviors and in real time of how people are, um, you can see the behaviors of people in real time of how they're using your website. So um, with Hotjar, you can see um, based on like, it could do an analysis, it could show you how people are looking at your site. Um, sorry. It could also give, it pops up a survey about how people are looking at your site. Let me look at this, sorry. Um, so the heat maps, what's cool about it is you could see where people are more frequently visiting on your page. Um, and then they do have um, they could show you kind of where the movement of people's cursors are. So this is kind of gets a little bit big brother and a little bit crazy, but I've watched this a few times where you can see how people are scrolling through your site. Um, you can watch video recordings of how people are going and navigating through your site. Um, pretty zany, but basically um, when I, I, when I was market director at uh, Yes Tomorrow Design Build School, I used this product just to be able to see are people going and registering for classes? Um, and are they are they doing the way the behavior we thought they would de we designed the site for? And when we saw that, like you know, there were certain things where people they stopped uh, from their registration process because there was something else that came up and that was a distraction, or they they lingered too long on something and then just went away from the site, or they spent too short a site. We corrected the design of the site based on what we saw in the behaviors of what we saw in the, in the hot jar. Um, there are, you can try for free. Um, there's also like a free uh, plan for this, this service. 
Um, and the way that works is that you'll be given a piece of code that you embed into your site. And then basically you go to a uh, hot jar and then you can watch numerous videos and insights on like how people are using your website. Um, as you go further into the service, it allows you to um, do, they pop up surveys and everything else to see what, how people, uh, what people are thinking at that moment about your site. And you've probably seen that in, in some other websites uh, where like a survey pops up and, um, and then you see like that you can see like what people's feedback are from from. Um, Finally, the last part is, is reputation management. And this ties a little closely with, with search engine optimization, right? It's the keys to maintaining your brand. Um, so there are different, there's, there's a, a couple of companies that do this. So essentially the work that does is it tells you when people Google search you, here's the links that come up in your first, second, third, 10th page of your Google search. So we'll keep a couple of things and probably figure it out. In your Google and in, in a, a search engine, you want to have all of your con your your brand. Your when people Google it, you want as much of it being positive content about yourself. The definitely the first ten results, which is the first page, a hundred percent of eyes are looking at that. So you want to make sure your website, in the very least, is on that first page. Um, and so. How do you how do you kind of maintain that momentum? You keep your website and your content up to date. You also um, announce all those up to date like up to date information so that people are constantly coming back and clicking on that. So it basically feeds into the algorithm um, for the search engine algorithms that your research results should be at the top for that particular content. Uh, you utilize social media to amplify and say, hey, we recently pu published this blog post about X or we had we recently launched this new product, come visit our website. Um, and then like whether in press, as I mentioned, like at the end of uh, an article that may be written about your, your organization or business, you can have a website, you, you, have, you should have your website listed at the bottom. Um, Again, the preference is that it's using your, your domain and nothing like where it obscures your domain. So for instance, some people they get, uh, they instead of attaching um, their website to their domain, they may say wordpress.farm.com. And that is really, that, that takes away from your site more than it does, it helps you with your SEO. So you really should have, make sure your website is connected with like your you know, yourbusiness.com or whatever it may be with a domain that you own rather than having that ad a joiner of, of whatever the uh, platform that you're using. Um, you know, having, having your um, email signature, um, you know, having your website in there, you can easily do this in Google when you, with your signature, you can automatically put your name and every time you're, 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 uh, you answer an email, then it pops in your signature with your, you know, anything from your social media uh, links that you want to have in there, um, and other, uh, other, and sorry, sorry, and um, social media sites. Um, you know, your newsletters. Again, you always want to pop it up so that basically people can go directly to your website. Um, and again, as I said, there's there's the business reputation services. So reputation.com is one of them. The one I use and that ha um, I mostly use this for personal, but basically you can also use it for, um, they actually have a business uh, end of it um, is brandyourself.com. Um, so they have a business end. I use the individual because for anyone who's Google searching me, but what's great about this service is that um, you, they kind of treat it like as you have a FICO score um, it scores like what what's your reputation out there? What content is out there? Um, it asks you what links do you know of that of content are out there, and then gives you instructions on how to improve the SEO. Um, so basically, it walks you through that and it helps you monitor it. Um, I get emails when anything pops up, content that I want to that I, it isn't relevant to me, that isn't related to my search. Um, but this, this is, a, um, I've been using this tool for almost almost 10 years, um, but it's really helpful in just guiding you through to boost your SEO. Um, so 
that's kind of the tail end. I always, uh, um, of, of this presentation, but I wanted to know if there's any questions people might have um, in regards to website, but also kind of like where we go next to the amplifying your brand. Thank you, Mieko. That was very informative and amazing. Um, do we have any final questions? Ah, I see Ellen, you wanted to chat. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah. go ahead. Okay, great. So we recently had a very weird experience. Like I said, we're a nonprofit and um, we built ourselves on, you know, resilience around COVID, all that sort of stuff and creating these four by four resiliency bed gardens and having online classes. And we found, this is so weird. There's another community farm in town and they recently wrote us a letter and asked us how they can loop us into what they do. And then they said, um, and then they sent out their newsletter, um, basically taking kind of our model, <laughs> adding it into what they already do, which was, you know, different, you know. So I'm wondering how for a business or for a nonprofit, how do you deal with stuff like that? And, you know, when it comes back to the website, um, you know, now we were certainly going to put our model up there about how we do things and whatever. And now we're kind of like in this quandary because these guys just kind of, you know, joined our bandwagon without kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> checking in really. And, and when they yeah. sent us the email, it was like, like three days before they sent out the newsletter. So it wasn't like they had any intention of like, how do we collaborate? So I, I was just so floored and so are the other people who work with me. So I'm just kind of wondering <laughs> how you yeah, I've had that deal with that before. in an above board business way and how do you, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, um, you know, the hard part about being COVID is that you don't have that time to like have face-to-face -face conversation. Um, I, I mean, I have definitely gone through that experience and I currently am especially running uh, Vermont Womenpreneurs where uh, one of the things is, you know, you, you produce or you do a certain activity which distinguish or is what your mission is. Um, and other people love it, but they, they want to do their own variation of it. And the only issue that comes up is it might confuse people, right, about what your intentions are and what you do. And so... I, one of the things that tactics I have worked on is I, I am, you know, as much, I embrace them and I, I also try like them because I, well, and I, the thing is there also is like, there's this idea that there are people, there are ways that people are doing something very, they, they're not, um, they're creating something because they may not see something that you're necessarily they don't see it, they're doing it a different way, right? Or they're doing, they're not, not, they don't see something they identify as the way that they would want to go about it. I think I, think, I would have said that had they not sent us the email that said, how do we basically take over what you're doing? <laughs> so that was the part that was the disconnect there. Yeah, so. <laughs> and I think then you go back and say, well, you know, we, we uniquely like to do this, carry out um, doing this project the way this way, um, but we also would love to open up the opportunity to collaborate because we don't, at the end of the day, are we doing this in service to, you know, our community, right? You know, are we going to confuse people about what, what, what our intentions are? And so how can we work together? I think mean, mm. it's not, um, you never want to get into a turf battle. You always want to be on the, the, <laughs> The, totally. uh, the upper end of uh, 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 your know, end of that, mm -hmm. you know, of the whole, and you don't want to kind of get dragged down of um, kind of in those kind of the, that kind of thing. So um, I would definitely say you open it up to collaboration, but then also the, the, the differentiation. But at the end of the day, what is the overall mission, right? Are you in, you know, you're in service to who, and are they going to be harm through the confusion are they me harm you know like at the end of the day you don't want harm right mm -hmm. to your community 
Um, and that's what I always kind of think about when I, I've had definitely been confused with some other brands. I also know I recognize like, oh, you have this gift that I'm not willing to go to. So particularly in branding, like when I um, I produce live events, I also know that my the the personality that it, it revolves around the personality carrying out and facilitating that, right? Because you that does come through more or less in in the way I I uh, produce events. I also know that the, another another variation or different people who are doing some variation off the theme of something that I've created um, are they're they're well intended and they're doing something different, right? Like so, somebody might be podcasting. I've attempted podcasting and I don't really want to do it. If that person wants to do it and share those showcase people in a different dynamic, awesome. How can I help promote that? Because it's not something that I do, right? Because it's just I have other tasks that I want to do. So I guess that's my advice is, is um, you know, everyone has a variation on something that is the common thing. As long as you're not harming the folks that you're, you are intending to help, that is, that's the key goal. Well, thank you so much, Mieko, for this presentation. Um, I know that I learned a lot about marketing. Um, if folks would be so kind as to fill out a short evaluation of the session, I've put a link in the chat and we would love to get your feedback. And um, Mieko, would you like to give a one minute pitch for your workshop yeah. this afternoon? Sure. So as I mentioned, like we spent a lot of time on thinking about website as your base camp. So now the next, the, sec the second section is about the amplifiers, right? So how do we create, um, how do we focus on our social media presence and amplify your message?